to have the mentality that you can read the Bible and figure out for yourself and decide for yourself what's genuine and what's not genuine, what they would have done and what they would not have done based on your own imagination shows that you can never recreate the early church because they didn't do that. They followed apostolic tradition, which is exactly what the Orthodox Church does. Okay, hey, welcome everyone to the Orthodox Christian Podcast. And today I have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Eugenia Constantinou. And for everyone watching or listening, Dr. Constantinou, why don't you take a second to introduce yourself and tell everyone what you spend your time doing. Okay, well, I'm Dr. Jeannie Constantinou and um, also known as Presbyteria Jeannie because I'm married to a Greek Orthodox priest. And the title uh, of the, the wife of the presbyter has a title, and it's like the feminine version of presbyter, presbytera. And so at, at church, people usually call me by my title, presbytera. And by the way, all the Orthodox clergy wives have a title that's sort of similar to their husband's title. So, um, so uh, my, I'm married to a priest. He's retired now, so we're not serving in a particular parish. And uh, right now, I spend my time writing. I'm working on a couple of books. And I spend a lot of time also on weekends, frequently traveling and speaking at different parishes when I'm invited to do so. And, of course, the usual, watching out for a husband in a house and lately a father-in-law who, my, my father actually, my husband's father-in-law, but my father who, who injured himself. But... Uh, he broke it. He's elderly. So we, we have to deal with, you know, sickness and elderly parents and things of that, of that nature. And at this point, are you talking about the books that you're currently working on? I don't mind talking about them or maybe we'll see. I mean, I started one of them. Well, actually, both of them, I would say, are follow ups to my two last books. Um, the Thinking Orthodox book there, I am working on a follow up that is. I think a bit more basic and down to earth kind of explaining the Orthodox mind in a way that, that the other book really didn't. Um, that was a, in some respects, more technical, more historical. This is more practical in a way. I don't know how to describe it. So I'm working on that. And then the other book is, is about the resurrection and that's a follow up to the to the crucifixion book. So uh, that's what I've been spending my time on mostly. Mm. Wonderful. So from what I gather, you were raised in the Orthodox Church. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your upbringing and what that was like? Yes, uh, I was raised in the Orthodox Church. My parents are both uh, children of Greek immigrants. So they grew up in uh, in the United States of children of, of immigrants, as I said. So we had, a, a I would say, a fairly typical Greek American house. Um, my family was not super religious or anything like that, but my mother, I think my mother was definitely more pious than my father, and she took us to church when uh, we lived in the San Fernando Valley, which is in the Los Angeles area. Uh, the church was, you know, a few miles away, and we went to church every Sunday. That's until I was about 11. And then we moved to uh, North San Diego County to a rural area, and the church was in San Diego itself, and that was a much farther drive. That was a 45-minute or an hour drive down to the church. They didn't have a freeway um, <laughs> at that time, believe it or not. And so, um, and as I'm really dating myself, to go down through, like, the center part of the county. And um, so then we didn't go to church quite as often. We went to church about every other, every other week. And, of course, we were almost always late. Because, of course, that's how, what the Greeks are. They're late for church. They're late for just about everything. We call that Greek time. So um, that was a really um, nice experience for me personally growing up. Uh, the church was definitely ethnic uh, in a way that it isn't. Today, I live in San Diego now, and I attend that church. It was the church where I got married. My son was baptized. My husband was ordained there. So my husband even served that parish for several years as the priest. So um, over the years, of course, it's become much less ethnic 
we have a lot of converts. We always had converts, but there are more of them today. Um, and it's just much more eth less ethnic because those of us who even are of Greek extraction are less Greek than our parents, who are less Greek than their parents. And so the ethnicity is toned down quite a bit. We still have Greek in the services, but growing up, it was pretty fun being part of the Greek community. The, the, the youth, I was you know, very involved in the teenage youth group called Goya, Greek Orthodox Youth of America. Uh, I was the president for a year in, my, you know, in very different board positions that they have. We did a lot of fun things. We had, you know, we also went to church. We were involved in church services and we did, you know, diakonia, ministerial kinds of things. But the the, um, the social aspect and being with other kids who had a similar background, I think, was really helpful to us because we really didn't feel like we fit in with the rest of society because our parents tended to be more traditional, a bit more strict uh, than um, the typical American parents that, I mean, when I went to school, I was the only Orthodox person in the school, you know, we're talking about that I knew of, um, you know, very, very uh, pluralistic society, even in a little smaller town. So it was a fun thing. And that ethnicity, we, we could relate to each other. We understood each other, uh, things that happened in families and, and the way things worked in the community. So it was a it was a fun experience. And I, I would say that in many respects, it was a much more tight knit community than it is today because people socialized. And I've I think I have a greater appreciation today for the social element of the church, that that it was a um, having that common ethnicity was a way that bound people together that um, is somewhat lacking today. Now, I don't think that's more important than the faith by any means, but the church was really the center of not only our religious life, but also our social life. And I think that uh, communities today, even if they're not an ethnic community, that have um, a component that encourages the members of the community to get together just purely socially, that makes for a much stronger community. And I think because it reinforces the identity and it gives, uh, it gives also the, the children a sense of identity. Um, as a teenager, you know, when all teenagers, regardless of what their background is, are looking for identity, well, where do I fit in? Where do I belong? And they'll find an identity someplace. They'll find it in a gang. They'll find it as a, maybe they decide they're going to be goth or they're going to worship Satan or whatever, or they're going to be, a, you know, the student government or they're going to be with the cool kids. They're going to find an identity. If the church is there and there's a youth active youth group, that, that becomes their identity. And I personally think that that strengthens their orthodoxy. That alone is not enough to do it um, if they're not going to church, of course. But I think it's a, it's a positive thing. The negative side of being in an ethnic community like that, the way it was back in the olden days when I was young, was that people did come to church just because they were Greek. And they wouldn't have thought that they were any less, that they were lacking in anything in terms of their faith. They would have felt that they were a committed Orthodox Christian. But when you looked at the behavior, maybe not always so much. They thought that they were perfectly fine. But there was also a, a, tip, a lot of typical, the Greeks can be very emotional, so when there were meetings after church, general assembly meetings, there was often a lot of shouting, <laughs> that kind of a thing. And I remember witnessing that. And my father, who was Greek American, um, was very good at handling that. So they usually voted for my father to, to be running the meeting. And I remember so often him saying, now, 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 let's not get emotional. And he was the one who would calm everybody down. Um, he's the one who broke his hip and his poor guy. Uh, is um, is trying to get over that. I haven't really talked about that, but that, that's not a big deal. But he, you know, this is uh, the reality of an ethnic community. But when you, you know, it was a it was a fun way to grow up, 
And it was a, I think we had very close ties. I know that for myself and for all of the kids who grew up together, that our church friends were much closer to us than our, we would call American friends, school friends. I never, I never visited the house of any of my school friends, but I was at the houses of my church friends. So I think that that was, knowing that the family had common values, whether or not the ethnicity is there, to, to know that your, your kids are socializing with others who have the same values, I think is really important. So that was a very long answer, but that's what, sort of what it was like. Well, it was a thorough answer. And I'm curious, at the home, did you guys have certain practices that would reinforce the faith in terms of like praying before icons or reading scripture or other practices? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, as I said, we, we didn't have a super religious house, but my mother was very devout and we had, of course, icons in the home. She always lit the, the candle, the candili. She would sense the house on Saturday nights and she would light a little sensor. I don't know if people have seen those little, not the kind of priest swings, but it's a little thing on a sort of like a stand. It has a little lid that opens. She would sense the house and, uh, and, um, we didn't do like a formal scripture reading or anything in the family, but you know, she, which she told us Bible stories and she bought a set of Bible story books that were very expensive at the time because they were color pictures and we read them and we would talk about Christ and we would ask our parents. And my, I remember my mother, we didn't have any Orthodox programming at all. Of course, she would listen to Protestant preachers on the radio or we would watch the Billy Graham crusades. I mean, things like this. It was religious programming. Uh, it wasn't Orthodox. There was no Orthodox programming. But still, there was a sense of identity as a Christian, and it was a Christian home. I never heard my parents ever utter a curse word in the house. There was nothing immoral in the house. We weren't allowed to argue or call each other names. So in that respect, I mean, it wasn't like a heavy you know, you're Christians, that kind of a thing. It was, it was relaxed. It's like who you're expected to be. And we would get to like, remember who you are when you go out, you know, with your friends, don't embarrass the family name kind of a thing. But it's, it was a, was a subtle thing, but it was a foundation that was clearly there. And um, I appreciated that. I really did. I didn't know any Greek swear words. I can't say the same about my friends. They all seem to know them. I didn't know them because I never heard them. Mm. You know? And as you were growing up, uh, were there certain challenges that you had to overcome as an Orthodox Christian? Um, in, in what respect? Yeah, so to be more specific, so the, you're living in a culture that's not Orthodox yeah, and it's right. pretty pluralistic. There's a lot of offers on the table, as it were. And as you grew up, I mean, at that time, it was more ethnically based. And so yes. there might have been some wrestling around that. But um, were there any sorts of challenges you had to overcome to, to remain? Oh, um, in the church, yeah. Um, no, I never, ever, ever considered being anything other than Orthodox. And I knew that I would never marry anyone who wasn't Orthodox. I didn't care if I never married at all. To me, that was extremely important. Um, I think that for for growing up in the church that was ethnic, definitely having the services be all in Greek, which they were in the 60s and 70s, obviously before that too, but they were entirely in Greek. Um, especially the weekday services, Friday nights, things like this. That was um, obviously, I didn't think about it, about, about it as a challenge. That's just how it was at church. You went to church and you stood there and the chanter went on and on and the priest did his thing and you, you know, you kind of looked around. <laughs> kind of a thing. That's what it was. But, um, and there were big arguments in the Greek parishes over language. Once the seventies came around and people said, you know, we need to have, start having some English. There was a lot of arguing in parishes over the extent of English the choirs. I remember when I first started singing in English in choir, I didn't like it. And the, a, lot of, a lot of the translations were really bad. The arrangements were bad. So it wasn't very singable. It's not that you can't sing well in English. It's just that they didn't know how to do it very well. Okay. So um, that was definitely a challenge, but I never considered leaving the church because of that. 
And also because I did follow along with the service books. When we had service books, which we did, and they were side to side, you had the Greek on one side, you had the English on the other. And as I, as I got older, as a teen, and certainly as a young adult, reading the prayers of the church, especially Holy Week, oh my gosh, I mean, unbelievable. How can you think about being anything else? When you read and you just, you're, it becomes part of your soul. You're just so imbued with this way of thinking. And I think that that's, that is the advantage of growing up in the church if your parents actually take you to church. Because I'm not talking about Orthodox Christians who are Orthodox in name and they just go a couple times a year. People who have a regular exposure to the church services that I did and follow along, and this really forms you. And so by the time I got to college and I was in a religion class and I heard things that I knew weren't right, I couldn't, I knew they weren't right, but I didn't know why they weren't right. I couldn't explain it. I couldn't put my finger on it. It was kind of in the neighborhood of being right, but it wasn't exactly right, you know, or in, in, even in high school, in a Catholic high school, because my parents sent me to a Catholic high school from 10th grade on. So we had religion class and I would hear things. I said, well, I don't know about that. This, something's not quite right. So how do I know that? It's, it's Freima. You're shaped by participating in the services of the church, even though they weren't all 100% in English, obviously enough of it sunk in for me to know that not to just accept everything that I heard in these other, you know, in these Catholic venues or classrooms, you know. Okay, so two questions that come out of that. One is, what are the attractive features about orthodoxy that were drawing you? And so you've mentioned this this culture or this deep richness uh, in the prayers. Yeah, I don't think it was. Yeah, I don't think it was a culture that that kept me there. I because I, I know people who didn't stay, and that's because they didn't really know the faith. So um, I I just there was there was some. Uh, yeah, I think maybe you express it better. A deep. Um, a sense of real depth of the faith that um, you you knew that there was something there was a there was a piety there was a holiness there was an antiquity that was real and of course we were told this is the true faith and we believed it but I also came to believe it because I could see the antiquity of it and I didn't see any reason not to to follow it. I wasn't looking for anything. I was never dissatisfied as an Orthodox Christian. So I just, I think I, I was very blessed in that way. I didn't have to go searching. I can't imagine what that's like to tell you the truth, but then I was always satisfied with my faith. So um, I always, I'm always fascinated by conversion stories. I really am because I can't imagine leaving the Orthodox Church and what that involves to go searching for something you think is out there that might be better than what you have. Um, I've never had to do that, but I really admire people who do because I think it takes a lot of courage. Mm -hmm. And so with um, your religious studies degrees and specifically biblical studies, so I'm going to get like slightly technical now. And so hopefully we'll keep everyone abreast of what we're talking about. But um, in biblical studies, obviously one of the main ways to interpret scripture is the historical critical method, which is looking at the background, like the textual background, the cultural background, the historical background of these texts mm -hmm. to understand them more thoroughly. And that can be a wonderful tool. However, it seems there are certain tendencies with biblical scholars that are looking at scripture from that lens that will more or less be interpreting things from a, a secular perspective uh, yes. and don't necessarily incorporate their faith. Uh, yes. They have faith, that is. Uh, so right. how have you navigated that space uh, uh, using the best of historical criticism, but still being yeah. a faithful Orthodox Christian? Sure. That's a really good question because the idea of using history and culture to understand the scriptures is patristic. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, Chrysostom begins every discussion about a book as he begins. If you look at his very first homily, in every single book, he has a, a series of homilies on John, on, on Matthew, and the epistles of Paul. He always talks about the author and his audience and his purpose and the setting. 
So this is normal and that's what we ought to do. But what, what we shouldn't do as biblical scholars, which you also mentioned, is try to interpret it in a secular way. In other words, without any faith perspective, because this, they believe that this is more honest, it's more objective. If you read the scriptures as though it's just anything else, you know, any other kind of writing without any faith perspective at all. For some reason, because of the culture that we live in, this Western rationalistic culture, there's this idea that we should simply analyze things and um, not interject our faith as if somehow we're going to understand it better that way. And in fact, we understand it far less effectively if we don't treat it as, because that's what the Bible is. I used to teach, you know, I taught at the University of San Diego for 20 years, Introduction to Biblical Studies. And on the first day of class, after going through the syllabus and the rest, I said, this is what, you know, this is our perspective. The Bible is a book of faith. Okay, it's not a science book. It's not a history book, even though there is history in it. It's not designed to be an objective account of historical facts. It's, it's a, it's a pre presentation of history through a lens of faith. It's a book about God. So how can it be explained or interpreted without considering the faith perspective? But a lot of people don't agree with that. Most, most Bible scholars don't. And even, even when they are people of faith, you'd never know it from what, what, what they write sometimes. And the Orthodox have a difficulty with that. And as a matter of fact, in biblical studies, there's been a lot of prejudice against Orthodox scholars. And I mentioned that in my book, Thinking Orthodox, that my question of Archbishop Demetrius before he was the Archbishop, which is Bishop Demetrius, why aren't Orthodox biblical scholars respected? Because there's famous Bible scholars among the Protestants and the Catholics, but no famous Orthodox, no world famous. We know the scholars within the church, but, and he says, because they don't respect us. And he was right. They don't respect us because they think that we're just parroting the, what was said, said in antiquity. And they would rather you come up with something novel, something fresh, something you know, innovative, or just apply your own brain to the analysis, forgetting that there was a community of faith that received these books and they understood what it meant better than we do today. So there's a lot of arrogance. There's a lot of hubris involved in biblical studies. For someone to say, well, I know what Paul meant. Those people who wrote about Paul a long time ago, they don't know, you know. Even if you just consider the fact that somebody like St. John Chrysostom living in Antioch, which is Roman Empire, speaking in Greek, his native language, which is the same language that Paul knew, you know, Paul also part of the Roman Empire. How can you think that we, thousands of years later, 2,000 years, are going to understand that culture better or what he meant by that word or that phrase or, you know, within the life of the church, how can we possibly think we know it better, understand it better today? But that's what they think. And that's a, that's a product of the Western mentality, unfortunately. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. And have you found a good way to incorporate this historical approach that takes the best of that research yes. with a spiritual interpretation? Because sometimes those are also uh, juxtaposed. I don't think they have to be juxtaposed. They certainly weren't for St. John Chrysostom and other interpreters of the Bible. He used the historical story um, he didn't spend a lot of time on the history or the, the cultural aspects of the story. He was less interested in that. But he took the story itself and used it to give a spiritual lesson. So that's what we're doing. And, that, and if the Bible isn't there to teach us something or to in, enrich our spiritual lives, then what do we have it for? Why is it there? And, and super analyzing it, somebody once compared that kind of analysis to like dissecting a frog, like we used to have to do in biology. At the end, you got these pieces and you don't even have the frog, you know? <laughs> what, what have you discovered? It's, you're, you're working on something as though it's a dead object. So, you know, as an Orthodox Bible scholar, um, I think, I, I, don't, I don't know why, I, don't know. I never had any issues 
with the university, I know that other people who were teaching the same courses did it quite differently. Um, they did not really have a faith perspective, sometimes not at all, sometimes um, almost antagonistic toward the Christian faith, which is surprising because I was at a Catholic university. But what I found in my experience, I just did my job. I mean, I tried, obviously, I what I wanted to convey to students, because I had a lot of students, they weren't all people of faith, and there were all kinds of religious backgrounds. This was, they had to take two religion or three religion classes. And um, sometimes they would end up in my class because it fit the time slot they were looking for, right? So it was, there, nobody was beating down the door to take, Doctor, sometimes they kind of knew who I was and they wanted to take my class, but most of the time, oh, I got to fill this requirement. You know what it's like, you know, in college. So um, uh, I wanted them to know the basics about the Bible, the basic history of the Bible, you know, talk about some of the issues that we hear about in the news, like Genesis and creation. We talked about that, the purpose of the Bible, manuscripts, the development of the Bible, the canon of scripture, and, and Abraham you know, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, the general sort of trajectory of biblical history, because I had one semester to cover the whole Bible, then Jesus, basic, what do Christians really believe about Jesus and why? Who was St. Paul? What was his contribution? That's the most I could do. And I tried to present that, you know, from a historical perspective, but I, I presented my subject with a lot of enthusiasm. And that is, rather than just being kind of cold and objective, I, I you know, I, I like my subject. So I'm enthusiastic about it. And one reason why is because I remember that teachers or professors who love their subject, they're really fun to be with in class. You know, it's much more engaging. I'll, I'll tell you, I was, I had to take Hebrew because as a New Testament scholar, you have to take, you have to have a working knowledge of Hebrew, Latin, Greek, French, and German. Okay, that's five languages you have to know. So I put off Hebrew to the end because everybody said it's so difficult because you know that you've got an entirely different alphabet and, and that sort of a thing. So the, the first day of Hebrew class, our professor talked about why she loved Hebrew. And she said that she came to Harvard, not intending to become a Hebrew major, but she did. She loved Hebrew. So, you know, that inspired me. So uh, I likewise tried to inspire my subject, my, my students to at least, even if they weren't a religious person, because I would have atheists too, uh, at least they had some appreciation for why people love the Bible and what they get out of it. We never had spiritual discussions in class because this was a university classroom. So I wasn't trying, I wasn't trying to draw out the spiritual meaning, but I was hoping that they were getting the message because every story has a message. And it's a message of morality, it's a message of right or wrong, it's a message of how God uses people that are the last person you would choose, like Moses, who doesn't want to go back to Egypt, he's giving God all of these excuses of why he should go. And yet, nonetheless, God knows he's the one. And God helps him to grow in, in confidence, in, in, in his faith. I mean, there's so many stories like this. So the, the least likely person, David, is chosen. This kid is going to be anointed as the next king of Israel. I mean, he's got no military experience. He's just a kid. So that means he's unimportant in the family, you know, things like this. So to just open their minds to these basic ideas about God, about morality, and hope that at least if they're not people of faith, it will help them understand why people are people of faith, that they're not, a, you know, you don't have to be an idiot to be a Christian. Because a lot of people think, well, if you believe any of these things, you're stupid, you're an idiot, you're an ignoramus. So I give them a reason to believe. And a lot of students really love that. I got very good <laughs> evaluations and they kept me around, even though I wasn't, you know, teaching like everybody else. You know? Right, right. And, and concerning Christian theology, I just want to run something by you and you let me know what you think about it. But it seems to me that Christian theology, it proceeds from the resurrection and that yes. it's from the light of the resurrection that the Old Testament and what Christ has done makes sense. 
And that's the, so to speak, heavenly perspective that illumines what happened prior. And so if we take the crucifixion as an example, let me just run this by you yes. as well. Um, okay. You've written on the crucifixion that there is like an earthly perspective that you can have of these events and there's a heavenly perspective. And the heavenly perspective is like a, a hidden perspective that is only revealed by Christ. It, it takes the resurrection to kind of oh. wake us up to this. And there are things that have these like two meanings in the crucifixion. So like the crown of thorns, for instance, on one hand, it's a crown that's it's like the glory of God. This is like the heavenly perspective, the spiritual interpretation of it. But from the earthly perspective, if you're just looking and seeing, uh, it is seemingly the judgment of God on Christ. And this uh, is what the Jewish leaders perhaps yes. would have considered it as. Oh, the the um, pain would have been. They, they, it was, they didn't put the crown of thorns on him. The Romans did that, of course, as you know. So they would have just considered the pain and the entire crucifixion, yes, as a negative judgment of God, yes. And so then, you're right, from I a historical wanna... perspective, it's just pain. Uh, but from a, yeah. it's got an irony, there's an ironic aspect that unknowingly they're really crowning him because he really is the king of glory. Heavenly yes, king. yes, yeah, and that's that's like the, the heavenly king. perspective that's kind of revealed yes. from the resurrection. Yes. And and the question I have for you is, um, so it, it seems to me that for those that see the resurrection as the glory of God, it becomes their glory, like it comes back to them in a way. And for those that see it as, say, like the Jewish leaders in the oh. Gospel of Mark, who see it as the judgment of God, it, mm -hmm. it becomes the judgment of the Jewish leaders. And so just to give one more example of this, mm. like in Mark, it talks about the abomination that causes desolation. And sometimes people take this as like an end times thing. But I think that this is actually the crucifixion itself. At least that mm -hmm. is the like primary source of the pattern in the sense that mm -hmm. the abomination is something done that's yeah. it's, it's like a horrible thing. And yeah. then that causes desolation is it's like what defiles a temple. And so it's as if the Jewish leaders are putting Christ up there as this sacrifice so that they can maintain their power. So they're subverting mm -hmm. the proper order of the universe and putting the heavenly things below the earthly things. They're aiming at the earthly things. Yeah. And this is what causes, it's, it becomes an abomination to them. It's like what happens in the prophets where they defile the temple, they abominate God's house and God says, well, I will make your house an abomination. So I'm just curious what you make of that reading of like this heavenly yeah. earthly perspective well well first of all um definitely there are many layers of meaning in the scriptures not just one or two so i don't think there's anything that you said that is would, would be considered incorrect except from a historical perspective which i'll get to in a minute uh, but you know you can the whole idea of the bible is that it has layers of meaning especially when we begin to meditate upon it as you as you did you really expressed kind of a meditation bringing it into the perspective of what does this mean for the jewish leaders um the judgment on the jewish leaders because they pass judgment on christ there's so much irony in the the events of the crucifixion so i don't see any reason to disagree with that i would say however that the abomination of desolation, you, you can say that the cross was an abomination. It led to the desolation. I, I think you could say that. Um, but Christ's uh, foretelling of the abomination of desolation would not have been his own cross. It would have been, and it was, the destruction of the temple at Jerusalem, which was to come. That was an eschatological thing, not in the sense of ultimate end times, but a future event that would change Judaism and the destruction of the temple by the Romans. Because he gives, he says, you know, woe to women who are giving birth or have little children. And if you see the armies flee to the hills, don't go back and take your cloak and all that. But that's about a war. That's about the destruction of the temple. It's within that thing that you talked about. It's within the eschatological discourse. He's talking about end times, but he's also talking about a closer um, expression of the end, what, the, what will be the end of Judaism as they knew it, the end of animal sacrifice and priesthood. It, well, and it seems like these are two sides of the same coin in the sense that when the Jewish leaders sacrifice Christ as an abomination, essentially, that this is the event that moves the temple from the building to Christ, who is the new temple, hence well, the tearing of yeah, the and just, Yeah, that, that's, I don't know that they, they, they would consider that they sacrificed him, um, he, there's a couple of ways you, I mean, I, I, I can see why you say that, but we would say that he 
volunteered himself, right? So we have to make yes, sure yes. that we understand this as a voluntary crucifixion of Christ. Um, so that they that did that lead to the abomination because they thought he was an abomination? Um, in a in, in a sense, I suppose you could say, but the the fathers certainly thought that this was one of the reasons why uh, the the temple was destroyed because they killed the Messiah. But of course, the Lord knew that that would happen. Would you have any advice for people who are interested in orthodoxy or looking into it that might not be familiar with, um, you know, maybe they're just checking it out at this point? Oh, <laughs> would I have advice? Um, no, except to say that you're on the right path. You know, obviously I believe that not having come from um, some background outside of orthodoxy, I don't um, have any advice in that respect because I never went through what they're going through, the searching that they're going through. But, um, the, you know, the, the, you, can't, you can't tell me that the Orthodox Church is not the closest to the ancient church, to the original church. Everybody recognizes that, just about. The Catholics say that we are. Of course, what they say is that we're sort of stifled and stilted and we're archaic and, you know, we haven't gone along with the times and that kind of a thing. So, uh, but, but everybody recognizes that our worship is ancient and that our prayers are ancient and our spirituality is ancient. So if you're looking for the ancient church, this is the place to come. A lot of people are looking for the ancient church. They're looking for the original church. But what they're trying to do with a Protestant mentality is to go create it. They say, I'm going to read the Bible and I'm going to figure out what the early church was like. And that's what we're going to do. OK, so we've got, you know, going back to the 19th century, Seventh-day Adventists, accepting some of the laws of Moses, worshiping on Saturday. Um, the Hebrew Roots Movement or the House Churches Movement. People say, well, back in the day, they, they worshipped in houses. So we'll just forget about churches. We'll just have houses. That, that's ridiculous. OK, that's just totally ridiculous. And but people think that they can recreate the early church, but they cannot. And here's why. There's a couple of reasons. First of all, we don't know enough about the early church. What we have in the New Testament is very limited. OK, how they lived in a day, how they structured themselves, what their worship services were like. There's most of what they did. We don't know. OK, that's number one. Secondly, to have the mentality that you can read the Bible and figure out for yourself and decide for yourself what's genuine and what's not genuine, what they would have done and what they would not have done based on your own imagination shows that you can never recreate the early church because they didn't do that. They followed apostolic tradition, which is exactly what the Orthodox Church does. The Orthodox Church is obsessed with preserving what we receive from the apostles. We've done that better than anyone. And so even though you could say, well, the priest's vestments, they don't go back to the time of the apostles. No, of course not. OK, but it's still early church. That liturgy is third century that we do on Sundays. It's the third century. How early do you want it to go? Uh, further back, we don't know everything that they were doing, but to decide for yourself uh, that you know and that you can decide which parts, you know, because there, there were sacraments. The, the baptism meant something. There, the Eucharist was really the body and blood of Christ. But if you as a Protestant say, well, it really wasn't because I don't think so. Well, you don't have the mind of the early church. You can't possibly um, come, up, come up with anything that resembles the early church since you lack the mentality to understand the scriptures. That's what I would say. And um, can you elaborate a little bit more on what that mentality is, aside from like just yeah. going to church? Like, yes. are there certain hallmarks of orthodoxy and orthodox theology yes. that you would want people to know about? The, the one thing, adherence to apostolic tradition. And that tr the word tradition is kind of like a very negative word among Protestants because they associate it with the Catholic Church. But what Catholics mean by tradition and even apostolic tradition is not what we mean at all. Because you see Catholics, for them, um, they've changed so much over the centuries. The Catholic Church bears no resemblance to the ancient church, practically none. 
practically none. In either in the way they do their services and the sacraments, the, the power of the papacy, that didn't exist in ancient times. Uh, many of they've elaborated and added a lot of um, ideas and theologies that didn't exist in antiquity. They bear no relationship to the early church hardly, except that they are still in direct continuation. They have their roots in the early church. There's no visible break, but they've changed so much. Whereas we have not. So why do they still say that they have tradition? Because Catholics are taught that Rome cannot err. E-R-R -E cannot be wrong. And as long as you're in unity with Rome, whatever Rome says is correct. That's a farce. That's a fallacy. As if everything that comes from Rome, and they believe that as long as the Pope and the magisterium, that's their gathering of bishops, say that something is correct and is apostolic, it is. And so for them, tradition is basically whatever Rome says it is, not for us. Tradition is what the apostles gave us. We keep that and we don't go beyond that, either to the left or to the right. We maintain what we were taught and we don't throw things out and we don't add things. Even though some people think it might be a very good idea. Why don't we make the service more contemporary? Let's have some upbeat music. We don't care. We don't care if it's contemporary. This is the worship of the ancient church. This is what we're going to do. Why don't we get rid of fasting? Because, you know, it's really difficult. and There's no per point to it. And the Catholics have basically eliminated fasting altogether. No, no, we're not. Because this is what we receive from the apostles. So the Orthodox are, uh, well, I'm not exaggerating when I say that we're obsessed. This is who we are. Because to tell us to get rid of tradition is like telling the Catholics not to have a pope. It's the essence of who we are. It's, it's what makes us orthodox, that we have kept the teachings and the theology and the practices and the worship and the spirituality of the early church unchanged. That's who we are. That's what we believe. And we don't care if it satisfies anybody. So the, the, the Catholics know that they have to be apostolic and they want to say that they're part of the early church. And, but for them, tradition is whatever Rome says it is. And they find some little snippet of some saying from the Bible or the fathers to bolster or to support the changes that they've made. But, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's like night and day, the difference between the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church. So just because Orthodox say tradition, don't imagine that we're like the Catholics. We're not at all. Right, right. Um, I, I guess they're my Catholic friends or right. students. <laughs> okay, because I, I understand why they are the way they are. I, I, I want to say, when I say these things, I say them very forcefully, um, but I also understand why Catholics are convinced that they are correct. Because from the time that they're small, it's drummed into them, Rome, Rome, Rome. Peter was the first pope. Peter was the first pope. And they've marshaled all of these um, scriptures to support that. But we as Orthodox look back at the history of the early church, and we know that Rome did not run the whole church. Even Peter didn't run the whole church. So how can the pope have this authority that Peter himself never had? You see what I'm trying to say? But it's so important to them. They can't really see any other way of believing. And so, you know, I respect what they believe, but they believe it's correct because they believe that all of the changes that have occurred over the centuries were, because they were brought about by Rome, correct. So if you believe that everything Rome does is correct, and they're also taught that the East is always wrong, by the way. They actually say in their seminaries, all heresies come from the East. They're taught this as if we're the source of all heresy. Well, you know what? The church comes from the East. Jesus was from the East, okay? All, all the councils that put down the heresies were in the East. You, you see what I mean? But this is what's been drummed into them, and they just can't see any way of thinking other than within that framework. And likewise, Protestants are the children of the Catholic Church. Protestants think in the same way as Catholics, except they reject Rome, and they have nothing to replace it with, so they say scripture alone. 
So in order to understand these things, you really have to understand the mentality and where it comes from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like in certain respects, there is uh, overlap between the Orthodox and the Catholic insofar as they do retain a sacramental imagination. Outward forms in the, in the fact that they have clergy, the fact that they have sacraments, but the meaning of those is very different. And the way they are practiced is very different. So they've deviated, they've departed from the, tr the apostolic tradition. The apostolic tradition was to baptize by immersion. That doesn't happen in the Catholic Church. This is sprinkle, sprinkle. Well, it's not, it doesn't have the same meaning. And the baptism for the Catholics is to wash away original sin. That's not what St. Paul talks about in Romans. He talks about dying and rising with Christ. That's why you go under the water. So there's a, there's, I, I don't, again, I don't mean to be insulting to Catholics, but there's an impoverishment of Catholic theology and worship and spirituality. It doesn't have the depth that the ancient church had. And it's also very fractured because being Western Christians, they have this idea that they can think about things and reason them out and come up with their own ideas. That's why you have a lot of different types of theology under the umbrella of Rome. Um, a lot of different spiritualities, lots of different orders, lots of different churches, and they just all operate under the umbrella of Rome, but they don't believe the same thing. They just don't. There's right. a wide variety of opinions within Roman Catholicism, and that's because they don't have a unity of the faith. And this is what distinguishes the Orthodox. We have a unity of faith. We're not united under a person or a figurehead or an institution. We're united because we have the same theology, the same spirituality and worship and practices. That's what unifies the Orthodox. It's not an, uh, not an artificial union where everybody's forced to be in this institution under one guy at the top. And that's what unites us. That's what unites Catholics. And if you take away the Pope, they're going to fall to pieces. They'll just be like, just like the Protestants. Right, right. Um, I did want to run one other biblical studies question by you just while I've got you. <laughs> okay. um, just, just for fun. So each of the gospels, there's four, four gospels, and they each have a different perspective to a certain degree. Obviously there's the synoptic mm -hmm. gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke that generally see things from the same perspective. And then there's the gospel of John. So I know that sometimes when we read the gospels or we think about Christ, mm -hmm. we amalgamate the different yeah. tellings of the gospels in our mind. And we have like a harmonized version, which can be helpful to fill in different details, but also it's, intriguing to me that the actual settings or the structure of the Gospels communicates meaning to us and that we uh, sometimes lose that to a certain degree when we just um, combine them. And I'll just give one example of this, if I may. Okay. In, in Mark's Gospel, for instance, there's only two healings of blind men and they come on either side of when Christ is saying that he's going up to Jerusalem to suffer yes. and die. And so they are obviously real healings of blind men, but they have a yes. greater significance in the sense yes. of they um, are pointing they to- bookend. They, they are, They're bookends to the trip to Jerusalem, yes. There is an yeah, intentional yeah, so, placement, is an intentional placement yeah. of the, those stories, yes. Yeah, so how do you, uh, as like a biblical scholar or someone in the church, mm -hmm. like what would be your recommendation for people in the sense of, um, on one hand, not not being afraid to you know bring the gospels together and have this like gathered view of Christ, but on the same note to actually appreciate what yeah. the structure is communicating. Well, uh, I think it's good for us to know that each of the evangelists had his, his own audience, his own purpose, his own place of composition. And especially the audience and the purpose is what drives the content of their gospel. Mark is the least structured of all of them. There's barely any structure at all. So some of them are very highly structured, but uh, Mark is probably the least. And he's also missing a lot of uh, teachings that the others have. So it's good to know these things to be an informed Christian, but it's okay if we know that we combine all of the aspects of Christ in our head, and that's okay because that's why we have four gospels. We don't have just Luke's version or just Matthew's version, it's the gospel according to. And so 
Um, it is all of these aspects of Christ's personality. If, some, if, if I ask the people in your life to write a book about you, they'd all give a slightly different perspective. It would still be you. They would discuss where you're from and your parents and your upbringings. And that, certain things would be the same, just like they are in the Gospels. But other things would be different based upon their own knowledge of you, their own experiences, and, and also what interests them about your life. So that's perfectly natural. So it's okay for us to, to recognize that the Gospels have differences and not to get all worked up. Well, why does this Gospel have this and it doesn't have that? Well, let, let them be themselves. Let them tell the story their way. Why does Luke have to answer to us to explain why he doesn't have the raising of Lazarus or something? It's, it's kind of silly. I know it's normal for us to think about these things, but that's a modern person's question. Let Luke be Luke. Let him tell his story his own way, you know? I think we have to respect them in that respect. But it's good to know these things. I, I'm all for knowing more about the scriptures and less. That's a good thing. But there's nothing wrong with, I mean, I don't think about Christ like divided. Or this is Matthew's Christ and this is Luke's Christ and this is Mark's Christ. I don't, I mean, he, he healed a lot of blind men. More of them than we could ever know, right? A whole lot of blind men. So Mark, yeah, he puts a structure. He says he's, there's a reason why he structures it. And that's kind of interesting when we analyze the Gospels because they're much more sophisticated in a lot of ways than people think. But I, I, ultimately what matters is that we get the message and that we change our lives because we can, we can have all kinds of knowledge about the Bible and be completely unchanged by it. And that's a tragedy. Mm. Mm. So if you, if you were giving advice in terms of reading scripture and engaging with it, um, well, actually two questions to, to conclude. What is the gospel in, in your way of presenting that? And then how would you recommend people engage with scripture? The gospel is that, Jesus, that the son of God became a human being as known as Jesus of Nazareth and that he uh, taught us how to live our lives, what it means to be a human, a true human, and also who God is by living among us. And that he chose to die on the cross as an example for us to follow, as an example of love and humility. And he conquered death by rising from the dead and opening, the, opening up to us the possibility of eternal life. That's the gospel in a nutshell. And as people are reading scripture and engaging with it, would you have a particular um, piece of advice for them to do that? Because there's lots of different ways to, to go about it, right? Well, I think, first of all, people are, are, first of all, you have to have something you can understand in English. A lot of people were given, like I was given, a King James Bible. I couldn't understand it. Okay, so you need to have a, a version of the scriptures that is something that's, that's understandable. Now, some of them are extremely contemporary, and they are so contemporary, especially among Protestants, that to me, it's really not the Bible anymore, because it's just really somebody's paraphrase of what they think it means. So the, the more contemporary the language, like NIV is really on the very edge of contemporary, if you ask me, now they have a a revised NIV, which is even more contemporary. Well, if you want to read that, there's nothing wrong with that. It's like reading a Bible story book. There's nothing wrong with that. Just be careful not to try to make direct conclusions about theology or something like that based on a verse in one of these super contemporary versions of the Bible. We have to be careful because on the one hand, everybody can understand something in the Bible. You hear it, read a story about Christ, you understand something with the story. It's on that level that everybody can um, understand it. On the other hand, there's a very deep level that you cannot understand without real knowledge and real training. So you have to be very careful not to become proud and think, oh, I know the Bible. I've read the Bible. Um, what about this priest? He doesn't know what he's talking about. I heard his sermons. He was completely wrong. So what happens is, that the evil one takes the good things that we do, like Bible reading, and uses it against us to make us proud and arrogant and, and think we have all the answers. Or if I really just apply myself hard enough, I'm going to figure this out. doesn't matter that generations of people have not been able to figure it out. 
I'm going to do it. You know what I'm trying to say? So we mm-hmm. read the Bible with a lot of humility. And we, allow, of course, we try to apply it to our lives. I think it's good to memorize scriptures. I think that's a wonderful thing. Memorizing Psalms, um, scripture. If you have, if you are reading something and a verse really strikes you, write it down. Have a little, you know, pad of paper by the bed where you write down and, and memorize those scriptures. That's a beautiful thing. So I don't think we have to approach it in any particularly analytical way or a scholarly way. Um, sometimes that becomes a hindrance. You know, like Jesus was saying that he said to his father, thank you, father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned and revealed them to babes. Sometimes the more education we have, the farther we can get from God because we think we can figure it all out on our our own. And the other thing is, of course, that the best way to understand the scriptures is through prayer. But even that, we have to watch out for the evil one, might lead us to spiritual delusion to think we're we're more spiritual than we really are. (laughs) Especially when we start to think we're spiritual, that we know we're not really spiritual. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Well, that is a wonderful place to conclude. So, uh, Dr. Constantino, I want to thank you very much for taking the my time. Pleasure. It's been a real pleasure. It's been my pleasure, too. Take care. Hey, guys. Thanks for checking out that episode of the Orthodox Christian Podcast. If you appreciated this episode, I would encourage you to share it with one friend or family member. Also, there are a couple links in the video description to check out. There is a Google Form link where if you have a question about Orthodox Christianity, you can submit it there. Also, if you want to read more into Dr. Jeannie Constantino's work or check out her website, those links are also included in the video description. And in the meantime, I hope that you have a peaceful week. Take care.